Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I trust that all of you are having a blessed day. It is a beautiful day in the Ozarks. In the Ozarks, in Louisiana. You can tell where I'm wanting to get back to, I guess. It's a beautiful day in Louisiana. The sun is shining. And of course, spring comes early to the deep south. Uh, it is a beautiful time. Very, very much appreciative of last night's service. Pastor Butler and Rachel did a great job leading us in praise and worship. Uh, we've had uh, a significant number of comments, and that will increase as, as we go forward. Uh, I've also benefited, and I think the work of God benefits, as you have shared what is being taught in this Living Beyond Your Crisis uh, with others who are your friends and acquaintances. And, and uh, there are several ways that you can do that. You can hit the share button. You can also go into your messengers, and you can send them a direct link uh, to the content, both what's being taught live and also what's archived there on Facebook. So uh, let's, let's use everything in our power right now to be effective with evangelism. Okay, I'm, I'm talking with... Uh, I'm talking with us about, I'm talking with you about salvation. Now, to get back into that, I want to kind of preface it with the statement, number one, I don't have all the answers. Number two, I encourage you to examine, to challenge, to question, to query, everything that you hear me teach, just as you should with any person you hear preach or teach, because it has to line up with the Word of God. And if I were a false prophet, it's not printed across my forehead. Uh, it's the responsibility of the listener to determine what is false or what is true. And falsehood is not based on somebody being likable. It's not based on someone speaking in an entertaining way. It, you can like someone who, whose message is false. And so it comes back to examining the Scripture and examining the Word of God. Uh, thirdly, ask questions as you would like, and you can post them below, or you can send them to me by message. And then uh, be aware that there are times I say, I don't know, and finally, we're always going to use the Bible in context. As I started to say, we are dealing with the concept of salvation and what it means to be saved, and I use several word pictures opening that uh, opening this. Uh, someone uh, could say, I, I was saved from making a bad financial decision by the advice of so-and-so. So they were saved from making a bad decision. We don't use the word salvation a whole lot in our common terminology. Um, it, uh, it's not a word foreign to us, but we just don't use it in a whole lot of sentences each day. So when we think about salvation, particularly uh, when applied to the Word of God um, and to our own need, exactly what does that look like? Well, I spent some time describing and defining that from the Scripture that uh, it is a change of our position, that we are immediately rescued, and uh, it is dependent on our following through with certain uh, prescribed aspects and requirements of us. I, I gave quite a bit of time to a number of passages of Scripture that talk about uh, being saved and what being saved looks like and what that is, what's involved with all of that. Now, I want to move, uh, and I think I'll finish talking about this foundational premise of salvation today, but if we can go back to the analogy that I used while I was opening this particular series of lessons last Friday, the girl who was drowning is going to need an outside agency providing what she does not have in order for her to be saved. The couple whose, whose marriage is depicted as failing, they have done everything they knew, know to do, but still their communication is poor and they constantly are at war 
for their marriage to be saved, it will likely require outside intervention, either by Almighty God or some counselor advisor who comes alongside to help them. So in both illustrations, there is an agency from outside that has to get involved in order for there to be salvation in these situations. Now, I'm stating the obvious, but I've discovered that the obvious is not always obvious. In regard to the sin condition and changing our spiritual circumstance from lost to saved, and in preparing us for eternity, all of us need something beyond ourselves to save us. And we have to realize that the, uh, the possibility of salvation comes to us through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an accomplished thing. God can add no more to redeem fallen humanity from their sin. Nothing else from heaven can be provided. It is finished, there remaineth no more sacrifice, it's done. Yet there will be people who will be lost in spite of every chance being given to them. So the focus of the lesson is not on what has already been done to provide salvation, but rather what must I do? And that question, and, or a paraphrase of that question, is asked twice in the book of Acts. It is, and there are people who would say, well, we don't have to do anything. But that doesn't seem to be the message of the Scripture. At the same time, this lesson would be incomplete if we didn't talk about three things that God has done to provide our salvation. Uh, the first of these is, is grace, and we ran across this scripture either yesterday or the day before, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God's God, not of works, lest any man should, should boast. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It is a gift given with no expectation of a return. It's not you inviting me to your house for dinner with the expectation of a return invitation. It would be you inviting me to your house for dinner knowing full well that there would never be a return invitation coming from me. So there's number one, there is the grace of God and there is nothing we could do to save ourselves if the Lord Jesus Christ had not granted us grace, but because of his grace, we can experience salvation. A second thing that's part of this is mercy. And the word mercy, which I talked about in a previous lesson just a bit, is, is akin to pity. It is feeling sorry for someone who is in difficult circumstances, difficult straits, or situations. You may remember Titus 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So without a God of mercy, who has made baptismal regeneration and Holy Ghost renewal available, I could not be saved. The third thing that God has provided, and I'm sure we could get an extensive list, but these three seem to be foundational, is the gospel. The word gospel is commonly translated as good news. But the question needs to be asked, okay, what form does that good news take? And it's very easy for the good news to be misunderstood. The good news is not the remedy that Peter or Paul 
and Silas offered in Acts chapter 2 or 10 or 16 or 19 or any of the other passages of Scripture, a right relationship with Jesus and faith in Jesus does not start with a Pentecost. It starts with the cross of Calvary. And in some instances, we have bypassed the cross and the resurrection to bring people to a Pentecost. And that's not the way the Bible shows it working. Peter gave the gospel message to the uncertain audience on the first day of the New Testament church. Paul and Silas shared the gospel with the Philippian jailer who was about to commit suicide. They, they had told him to believe, and in, in time, uh, he was going to be baptized. But uh, before any of that happens, they sit down with him, and they share with him. And, and the Bible is not clear what they said to him, but having read of Paul's experience and having read what he declares and expresses in the various uh, epistles, I have an idea that the communication to the Philippian jailer went something like this. Number one, all of us, including Paul, Silas, and the jailer, have a sin condition. That sin condition is universal. It brought home to him that he was a sinner. Secondly, they would have told him of the Messiah who had been promised to the Jews. Now, this man was not a Jew. He lived in a city that was quite distant from Jerusalem. It may well have been that he knew nothing about the promised Messiah, nothing about Jewish writings, nothing about what had been declared. So they take time, as I'm envisioning it, to tell of the Messiah who had been promised to the Jews, of God manifesting himself in flesh, of Christ, this Jewish Messiah, having, revived, having arrived, that his name was Jesus, and that the various qualities and benefits that the Messiah would bring were all accomplished in him. Okay, so now, he's talk, now they've talked with him about the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, that he has come to the Jews. Now they talk about the barrier being broken, that Christ, the Messiah, had not just come to the Jews, but that non-Jews, just like him, just like the Philippian jailer, were included in all of the benefits that came as a result of the Messiah. They would talk to him about the Lord Jesus having been rejected by the Jewish religious and political leaders and it being coming so intense that, that Jesus was crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb, but that marvelously, marvelously further validating that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was raised from the dead. In light of what that jailer had seen and experienced with prayer meeting and praise and worship and an earthquake, and then these fellows sticking around instead of running for their lives, he believed. He believed who Jesus was. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And he believed what Jesus could do and what Jesus could do for him. And he was baptized. So the Bible answer regarding the gospel is not in the man in time being instructed to be baptized. And we so often get this wrong. But the Bible answer regarding the gospel is given in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where Paul says to this uh, church of believers in the city of Corinth, and by the way, they were just extremely carnal, but he says to them, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which 
also ye are saved. Gospel, I said it, you heard it, you believed it, by the gospel you are saved. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. What, what Paul's saying is when I came to Corinth, this Greek city, when I came to you, my first message was to tell you the gospel of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was also the first thing that he received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, the gospel death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no Christianity. There is no salvation. There is no redemption if there's not a Calvary. We have to start there. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day. And his resurrection opens up the way to both a resurrection from spiritual death, Remember, we who are now saved, we were dead in trespass and sin. For some of you who will listen, your spiritual condition right now is that you are dead in trespass and sin. It is through the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have the potential to have spiritual life in what is now an experience of spiritual death, and it also gives us the hope and the promise of eternal life. No wonder this is called good news, because it comes home to each of us that this is what impacts us. So the story of salvation and the part about communicating salvation should put all of us to rejoicing about the possibility of our being saved. So now let's, let's go back to the questions that were asked on the day of Pentecost and that the Philippian jailer and others have asked all through history. And if I can use the analogy of the drowning child one more time, how can she be saved? Well, it's going to take an outside agency. So the lifeguard has swam out to where the child is. In her panic, the child is fighting the waves and begins to fight him. And you have often read, as I have, that a drowning person puts themselves and the lifeguard at risk. And this is the case until they come to trust the one who has come to save them to believe that this outside agency is not an additional part of the crisis, but instead that this outside agency, this lifeguard, can actually bring them to safety. They have to trust. Now, trust and faith are not exactly the same thing, but there are some parallel aspects to it. From the Bible, we learn that it is essential to believe God and his word, or we will never take another step toward being saved. Faith is an absolute requirement in our coming to God. We need head knowledge, but head knowledge within us or nodding our head, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. And uh, all that the Messiah has, yes, yes, I, I see that. I agree with that. But all of our mental affirmation and all of our head nodding is not sufficient to save us from sin. And I, I realize that I'm going to borrow it a bit out of context, but if this were true, the demons would be saved. James 2, 19. If you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. The demons, like the one cast out of the girl in Philippi, 
They believe in one God. They believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But their knowledge and their mental affirmation is not the same as having faith. Consider the following portions of Scripture that describe the importance of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, but without, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By the way, Hebrews chapter 11 is renowned as the faith chapter. And the scripture clearly teaches that none of us can be saved through our works. But when you read through the faith chapter, it's interesting that every person who is spoken of as a hero of faith has their faith expressed in an action or in a behavior. So faith is not some abstract thing. John 3, 16, you know the story. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's the qualifier there? Whosoever believeth in him. There has to be faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, Paul said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Well, pastor, I, I believe the same thing the Philippian jailer came to believe. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised to the Jews. I believe that Jesus came to be the Messiah the anointed one, the savior for the entire world. I believe in his name. I believe that everything the Old Testament describes about what he will do and can do, that that is available to me, it's provided for me. I believe that Jesus was, was uh, crucified, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. I believe it's all done, finished, I'm saved. Well, that was, let me, let me pose this question. Was that the case in the behavior of the Philippian jailer or of Peter's first audience? They believed, but then those who were speaking to them took them beyond simply mental assent or even trust to specific behavior. And the first that is common, and we'll talk about this one extensively later, as really going to talk about all of these, but, but repentance. Repentance is one of the foremost doctrines of the New Testament. And it is an action or a behavior on our part that follows our believing in Jesus, the gospel message, and his word. In Acts 17 and 30, and I just draw a portion of it, but the context of it will secure what I'm saying, that God now commandeth all men everywhere to do what? To repent. In Luke 24 and 47, as the disciples are being commissioned for their future tasks, it is included that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So what is this business of repentance? Well, as I understand it, it was a Greek military term that reflected an about face. So you're marching that direction and you decide to make a U-turn and walk in another direction. That's what repentance really looks like. That's what repentance is all about. It's a person making a U-turn in their life. And you see this over and over in the scripture. It's not simply the mental affirmation. It's not simply, amen, I believe. But instead, there is this absolute essential requirement of repentance, that there be a U-turn in a person's life. Okay? Let's think about that for just a minute. A person is a... Uh, is someone who is a thief. They come to believe in, in Jesus. They believe he is the Messiah. They have this mental affirmation of who he is, that they keep on stealing. 
as that person met God's conditions for salvation. Well, in, in our common, in common presentations of Christianity, there is really no call for marked change. But in the scripture, when people were converted, when people were saved, there was a marked change. Something interesting to just think about. Have we made an about face in our life? Not only was repentance part of this, but over and over, you, you see water baptism as a part of God's plan. And baptism is going to be a subject of an entire lesson. So I don't want to get ahead of myself here and uh, give too much time to this. But in John 3 and 5, and we'll spend some time explaining this, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Matthew 28 and 19, Jesus left his disciples with this commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's an interesting exercise, but do you see it baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost? It's an interesting exercise to diagram Matthew 28, 19, like we learned to do back in the sixth grade. Remember what it was like. There's a noun and there's a verb and there uh, can be a direct object and there's adjectives and, and adverbs. And I, I, I don't even remember how that they were laid out as we diagrammed them. I just remember that there were these various parts uh, of a sentence. Well, where I'm not doing all the work on this project, how about you diagramming Matthew 28, 19, and you, you may have to go online, which I would likely have to do, and get a refresher on what it looks like to diagram a sentence. Diagram it on a sheet of paper, or if you can figure out how to do it using uh, a computer program, uh, that'd be fine too. But whether it's on a sheet of paper or something you do on the computer, Post what your diagram looks like below here. Or if Facebook does not let you do that, instead just send it as a guest post and it will be looked over and uh, of course will be, will be posted. It's interesting. There, there, there's more, there's much more. We'll talk later about the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, which is a synonym for exactly the same thing. But I, but I need to, uh, I need to wrap this up today with just a few things. Questions: Do I accept fragments of truth cherry picked to match a preconceived notion? Can I afford to do that on such a vital matter as salvation? We've spent several days on verses that reference being saved. And as I asked previously, do you, do you see anything in all of that which you just say, let's cut this part out? And if we ignore it, that's basically what we're doing. You may have read the account of Thomas Jefferson's Bible. Thomas Jefferson did not believe that God performed miracles. And so he had someone put him together a Bible where that all of the references, every miracle that is recounted in the scripture had been cut out. Thomas Jefferson's Bible, because he did not accept it in its entirety. He took the magic marker, so to speak, and he said, this part, this part, this part, I, I don't accept, this part is irrelevant, this part is unimportant. We dealt with a number of verses within their context. Can I dwell on mental ascent and stop there and ignore everything that Jesus and his disciples would later say about Penance. 
Can I go to a water or swimming pool and, and be baptized but skip repentance? Can I dwell on faith and ignore what Jesus said about baptism and what was carried out regarding baptism? Now, you have to study all of this. Uh, please don't be deceived by my teaching if it is extra biblical. Do the same for anyone else you listen to, even if you are in a place where you've been part of a tradition for, for decades even. Examine the scripture, dig in, look for yourself. Don't be deceived by, by my teaching or that of anyone else. Question, reconsider, read your Bible, obey what the Bible says. Because what the Bible says about being saved is what's going to save me. It's what's going to save you. There's a final verse that I want to drive home, and that is this. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Okay, if you have questions, uh, you can message those to me. You can also send them to me as a uh, below here somewhere. Or if you're interested in a personal Bible study, uh, likely by FaceTime or some other medium right now, since we're de doing 30 days of kind of uh, being locked away from each other, and it may even be that you have several friends that would like to do the same, but there's no way for the cluster to get together. Um, there are ways now with online resources to, to have a study, even though people are several miles apart, to be done using a laptop, iPhone, iPad, uh, using some resources that Google or a number of other uh, software applications provide. So if you're interested in a personal Bible study, we have good teachers. And we have an interest in answering any question that you might have about salvation. Let me pray with us. Tomorrow we start talking about repentance. Lord Jesus, it's a challenging and difficult time. And um, the great story of just now is a virus that's sweeping the world, but there's a greater story, and that is that you, Almighty God, chose to redeem us, you chose to salvage us. You've chosen to deliver. And I thank you for that every single day. I never want to forget the goodness of God toward me. Lord, as we move into this, let us be effective with evangelism. Thank you for those that were baptized earlier in this week. We give you glory. Let them be the first fruits that by the time we come out of this, that would be 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 that have been baptized I give you honor and I give you glory. I rejoice in your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being part of us today. Share. Send it out. Send it by messenger, people that you influence, people that you have impact with, backsliders, people that have lived at the edge of the church. Let's connect with them right now in this difficult time. Love you. God bless.